Okay, welcome. Welcome to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE Series. Uh, obviously, we've just opened up the webinar, if you can hear my voice. Uh, we've got about uh, uh, just under 15 minutes to go before we'll actually get rolling with the uh, presentation. Um, thank you very much for joining us. It's been uh, a lot of webinars over these past weeks. We've done over 50 webinars. Those are available at YouTube uh, for you to review. If you missed anything, you want to share that with your staff members. Unfortunately, we cannot give you CE credit for watching a YouTube video at this point. In the future, the Washington Academy of General Dentistry is looking at uh, creating an online platform. So in a couple of months, uh, look back uh, and there might be the ability to do those on-demand CE courses. We've got a full day of CE today. We're going to start with Dr. Dr. Marcus Trolsch who is going to uh, be speaking to us live from Germany. We greatly appreciate him doing that after a hard day of work. Uh, that's followed by Patterson Dental that'll help us uh, with some of the equipment issues uh, and getting everything back up and running uh, when we go back to work uh, on Tuesday the 9th. That's the date we've been given right now. Uh, we'll have a little better idea. The governor has a uh, press conference this afternoon. Hopefully he doesn't throw us any curveballs. And the Dental Quality Assurance Commission is meeting this Friday at one o'clock. Uh, they're redoing that webinar that did not go for them uh, last week. So as you come in, get familiar with your uh, Zoom interface. Uh, you're going to see that we have a chat feature. That's an area you can just type comments. Dr. Hayamoto will be sharing uh, information with you in that chat feature. If you have questions today, the questions will be going into the Q&A section. We'll repeat these messages many times here before we get going. Uh, but again, thank you for joining us. If you uh, want to look up upcoming webinars, go to WashingtonAGD.org or take a look on our Facebook page. We're, it's easier for us to put upcoming webinars on our Facebook page uh, because uh, just uh, it's simpler to do than trying to upload to our website. There's QR codes for upcoming webinars. There's also QR codes there for paid courses at the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, our master track. Uh, uh, educational center uh, is down at SeaTac. Uh, we built this a few years ago and uh, it's housed in the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers local 77 building. Uh, and why are we bringing them up? Well, we want to give a big thank you for their support through this pandemic and helping us out with our uh, lease there. They appreciate the uh, concessions they made. Uh, that's very kind of them. We'd like to thank the University of Washington School of Dentistry, CE. They'll be handling your CE credits today. We'd like to thank the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics for um, sharing these webinars in Canada. Appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to thank Comet USA and we'd like to thank Patterson Dental for helping us out and uh, promoting these webinars as well. Uh, we couldn't do it without the support of uh, these different uh, vendors uh, and appreciate that. You'll see that uh, Tyler Jones is uh, going to be with us on Thursday talking about uh, employee manuals, human resources type stuff. So uh, please uh, sign up for that webinar. That should be a good one. The Braves are back with us tomorrow morning. So uh, I believe that's a 930 start. The flyer will be going by. You can use that QR code. So qu if you have questions for a CPA, uh, they're going to be joining us again, talking about the updates that are occurring almost daily with the PPP program. So uh, they will have good information, but as always, they'll be uh, uh, referring you for specifics to your own CPA. Uh, but uh, they should be able to handle 90% uh, of the questions that we have. We'd like to thank Dr. Ch Chad Bergdorf and uh, Dr. Mark Donaldson for our courses yesterday. We did our uh, mandatory suicide intervention training and our opioid training here, and that was a free benefit for AGD members. 
and some of the others that joined us on there were able to see those uh, webinars as well and get CE credits. So thank you for those uh, speakers that put that together in a very short period of time. We made that happen from Friday last week to making it happen on this Monday. Um, those of you that are interested in hands-on CE, uh, the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Educational Center at CTAC, uh, will be opening up our Master Track program, uh, the 2020 and 2021. You can actually register for that as well um, right now at WashingtonAGD.org. Uh, uh, that's a tremendous value. We've got four sessions. And those sessions uh, are 28 hours of CE uh, at a time. Uh, this Wednesday, Dr. Yassine's doing his last implant study club, part five, soft tissue management and dental implants. That's going to be at 12 o'clock PM Pacific Standard Time. And that's been very well received. You can see his previous parts uh, uh, of that implant study club on YouTube. That's Washington Academy of General Dentistry uh, on YouTube there. So if you go to YouTube, uh, please make sure when you go to our channel, like, subscribe, ring the bell, and uh, we'll keep you up to date as webinars are added. This is the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. Your CE credits will be coming from the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE uh, department. We thank them for handling these CE credits. Your credits, your CE credits will come to you via email uh, at the email address you registered for this webinar at. And those will show up probably in two to three business days. Please do not contact us at the Washington AGD regarding CE credits. Your CE credits are coming from the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department. For those of you that are interested in doing implants, we have an implant continuum hosted by Dr. Yassine. That's 10 um, different um, sessions at 24 hours uh, each session. That's a hands-on CE course that we offer here in Seattle at our educational center. It's a great opportunity. Those of you that are interested in orthodontics, Dr. Bin Tran is continuing his orthodontic uh, series hands-on as well. And uh, this afternoon, uh, Dr. Karbosh is back to answer as many questions as she can uh, that came after her presentation last Friday. So she's been working hard going through uh, all the different questions, trying to boil those down and come up with some answers for us on some things that are, are just not clear at this time. Uh, can understand the frustration out there. We just need a little bit more guidance. We're doing our best here to help that and try and bring in individuals that may be able to uh, put a little clarity on some of these things uh, as we uh, uh, get new guidelines, um, updates, regulations, etc. cetera. Uh, but this is tough to do uh, right now. Uh, the Dental Quality Assurance Committee is not meeting till Friday at one o'clock p.m. So hopefully they'll get some more guidance from our governor and just give us a little bit uh, uh, direction as we go back to work next week on Tuesday, uh, May 19th. I'm looking forward to that, but obviously there's gonna be a lot of changes in what we're doing. And uh, I know there's a lot of questions out there, a lot of concerns. Today's uh, lecture uh, is really a nice presentation by Dr. Trulsh. It, uh, good information on dental aerosols um, and just uh, staff concerns, PPE, et cetera. So looking forward to uh, having him tell us what's worked in Germany and uh, uh, what hasn't. So we're, about three minutes away from start here. We've got about a third of our participants into our webinar right now. So we'll just give a little bit more time. We've got over 1400 uh, people registered for today's webinar. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, again, uh, just play around with the interface 
you will see that there's a uh, ability to um, put questions into the Q and A feature. The Q and A feature um, it should be, uh, depending on your computer, down on the lower aspect there. Click that. You can put questions in there, and we'll try and boil those down and get to the, as many of them as possible. I want you to keep in mind uh, it's late in Germany for Dr. Trolsch, so we're going to do the best. Uh, let him get through his presentation, and at the end, uh, we'll hit him with a few questions. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a ton of questions, and we won't get to them all. Before you put a question in the Q&A section, take a look at what questions have already been asked. If you like a question, upvote it, and there's a greater chance we'll get to your question. The chat feature is fine for little comments here and there. We will not be taking questions out of the chat feature. Uh, be watching that chat feature and you'll see uh, information from Dr. Hayamoto throughout uh, today's webinar. We're not going to use a hands up feature either today. So uh, there's no need to raise your hand. Mr. Walker, if you don't put your hand down, I'll cut it off. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate everybody. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Walker. Uh, no, we'd like to thank our students uh, from the University of Washington School of Dentistry. Uh, AGD student chapter for joining us today. Uh, Mr. Walker is one of those students. Uh, uh, we'd like you to, if you get a chance, go to our Facebook page. It's Washington Academy of General Dentistry. There's information there on upcoming events and webinars uh, as we kind of wind down our webinar series here. This has been the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. Uh, some of our co-sponsors are Comet USA, um, Patterson Dental, the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prosthodontics, and the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department. The University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department will be handling your CE credits for today. Those CE credits will show up in your email box within two to three days. Uh, for those of you that are AGD members, we will be reporting your CE credits directly to the Academy of General Dentistry. Those uh, should be uh, on your transcript within two to four weeks. You'll see that there's uh, some flyers going by with upcoming webinars. You can use those QR codes to go directly to the registration page for those upcoming uh, webinars that are going to finish out uh, the WAGD Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. We've done over 50 of these webinars. Those are available on our YouTube channel. You can get there by going to WashingtonAGD.org and just clicking on the YouTube link or you can uh, simply go to YouTube and look up Washington Academy of General Dentistry and uh, those uh, videos are available. Remember in that channel to like, subscribe and click the notification button uh, so you're made aware of upcoming CE events. Well, let's see, we're just after 10 o'clock. Wow, yep, and our numbers are now really spiking. We're gonna get up close to that 1400 uh, mark that we have registered. With that, um, I'll just say one more time, welcome to the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series today with our uh, Zoom meeting. If you have questions, put them in the Q&A feature. You have a greater chance of having your question answered if it's not a long story problem, that it's short and concise, uh, just to make it easier to um, get the uh, question to our speaker today. And speaking of our speaker, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And it great, gives me great pleasure to introduce my good friend, Dr. Dr. Marcus Trolsch. Uh, it's welcome. Thanks for inviting me, Jimmy. It's a big pleasure to be with you guys. May I read your biography? Oh, please don't. It always uh, makes me blush. 
Ah, this is a good one. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Dark, Dr. Marcus Trolls. He's an MD and a DMD. He completed his dental training and received his DMD in 2005 from the dental school at the University of Erlangen in Nuremberg, Germany. In 2010, Dr. Trolls completed his medical education at the medical school at the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg, and received his MD. Dr. Trolls continued his studies in 2008 and 2009, specializing in restorative and aesthetic dentistry. He spent six months in the Department of Surgery at the University of Sydney in Australia, and then proceeded to the Department of Maxillofacial Surgery at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. Afterwards, he performed his residency at the university clinics in Bochum, Germany, and Göttingen, Germany, where he passed the board exam for maxillofacial surgery. Dr. Trolsch was appointed as consultant and senior physician for maxillofacial surgery at the University of Göttingen in January 2016, where he still teaches. With his father and his brother, he maintains a private office for dentistry and oral and maxillofacial surgery in Ansbach, Bavaria, Germany, and directs the Department for Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery at the hospitals of Ansbach and Firth, Bavaria, Germany. In November 2016, he was elected as the director of the APW, the Academy for Postgraduate Continuous Education of the German Dental Association. He lectures and publishes internationally and nationally on various topics, especially up-to-date procedures of methods of augmentation of jaws, implants, and the various aspects of medicine and dentistry. He is a main author of the Augmentation Guidelines paper of the Consensus Conference of the German Society of Implantology, which will be published in 2020. Now that is a fantastic biography, but I, I just want to let everybody know that you've been such a good friend uh, of dentistry. You're uh, a member of the International Academy of Nathology, uh, the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry. We've got to spend a lot of time with you over these years, and I'm just sorry we won't be able to join you uh, for your wedding. And um, well, I guess we've postponed that, have we? We've postponed. You'll, we'll, we'll party that for that together. <clears throat> All righty. Well, welcome. And, and again, thank you for doing this. I know you've done this lecture a number of times, but it was so important for me that uh, our participants get to hear you live. So thank you. I'm going to mute myself. If you need anything, let us know. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm absolutely overwhelmed. Uh, to be honest, it's it just makes me very happy that you invited me, Timmy, as, as you guys became so close friends to me. Just uh, to tell you a little bit of my story when it comes to the United States dentistry. Basically, through my parents, we got an American family, like the Dr. Brodin family from Rochester, New York. Uh, if anybody of those is watching, hi, we love you, we miss you. And uh, through, those, uh, through this great family, amazing family, we got into contact with all you guys. And this developed into long-lasting friendships, right? So I'm really, really happy that we can spend at least some digital time together. So um, basically, we were talking about the corona crisis a bit. And um, basically, out of a mood, my brother and I decided to go down into the data and see what pesters dentistry so badly about this. And we have a very special situation about this in Germany dental offices were not closed during the pandemic and we were still open. This was partly a tough fight and it was, was close to being closed, but we managed to, to present enough science and data that it's A, not necessary to close dentistry and B, not beneficial for the general health of the population. It even is another hit into the general health that we don't need during a pandemic. And so we, we focused on the literature and I'm just happy to share that with you guys. So um, I'm also very happy uh, that I have some sponsors at the moment and I wanna thank them, especially it's Bego and Geistly, those two great companies. We work together a lot anyway, but um, especially for this situation where we're doing a lot of talks, webinars and research at the moment, their support is invaluable. So thanks again for that. A question 
to me that we discussed together was exactly this that you can see you now. Should dentistry stop until the virus vanishes? And this is a decisive question as it contains so many of the, of the problems we're facing right now. Should we stop? What happens if we stop? When does the virus vanish? Does it vanish at all? Or do we face a situation comparable to HIV and hepatitis C where we are facing a new virus that is part of our professional life that will just not go away? So to make, get some clarification into this, these are the questions I'm going to go through with you guys. This is basically the structure. And I'd love to start with, for me, in my perspective, the most important question of all. Why do we work at all? Is it just to sell shiny white teeth? Or is there anything beneath that? Maybe an important thing to know in, in Germany, in German, the word dentist translates as Zahnarzt, basically physician for the tooth. And this crisis shows us more and more how important that is that the historic background of dentistry that basically came from barbershops, as you all know, um, sort of develop, developed into a medical field. And uh, I really like that comparison of dentists and barbers, as in some parts of the world, barbers were allowed to open earlier than the dentists. However, we have to accept that surgeons developed from butchers. So maybe that's something comparable, right? So my brother and I uh, did all this together. It's just through social distancing reasons, that's just one guy sits in front of you. <laughs> Matthias is the guy to the left, me is to the right. Uh, we have basically similar uh, bios. Matthias spent some time in Rochester while I was in Sydney and Zurich, and he also went for his PhD. This is our family office to the right. You can see our dad, Timmy, you guys all know him, right, from IG and Restorative Academy. Uh, he is 76 now, he's still practicing, and we we're very happy that he does because he teaches me so much. Plus, and on the left, you can see our office, a picture that was taken during the pandemic. You see everybody just geared up and open windows. And those two things are essential for our ongoing work. So Timmy, as you were already so kind to point out, our main work is not biology or, or, or corona. We basically came into that through the need to gather information as none was provided. It was the same in our country. Nobody really knew what hit us, although the pandemic was emerging or known since January in China. And we followed that as closely as possible. So we're usually focusing on dentistry and or maxillofacial surgery. And our main field is in bone and soft tissue augmentation and implantation for non-healthy patients. Why we work, is dentistry important? And that's the second don't call it paper, call it pamphlet we published, right? On the 15th of April, this was in the wake of the situation where we nearly had a close down in Germany and we were working against that. So basically we focused on why do we work at all? And I just have some literature, as I know quite many of you are from a PROS background, as we start with the PROS side, right? Um, which is quite interesting, as the more we learn about our eating habits, the more we understand how important the teeth are for a healthy living. It's not only that we can chew, that we can eat what we like to eat. You know, I'm from Bavaria. We have these big slugs of pork meat that we bake a lot and with a big jug of beer, right? Uh, maybe, basically, you could tell everybody, oh, we could just eat, live off astronauts' food, right? But that's just not the point. There's so much evidence out there that the freedom to eat whatever you feel like you're eating, that feeling what you like to eat is deeper in us than just appetite or advertisement. It's our body telling us, partly at least, I, if, if I was listening to my body, I would eat chocolate all day, right? So you have to make sure your body doesn't tell you total BS. But in general, it tells you what you need. So we have evidence that the consumption of fresh fruit, vegetables, stuff like this is increased when people have proper teeth. And this is already from 84, so pretty old. And we can go through that a lot. Vitamin C was significantly, significantly reduced when people have less teeth. And we know how important vitamin C is in this pandemic to fight a virus. And we go through that with body mass index. We even have studies that show us how many teeth have to be functional. And all these studies, it's important to note 
that it's not significant whether a human being has his own teeth or well-restored teeth. It's just that they're there and functioning, right? And uh, for the further we go, the more we get about that. So we get a lot of information that health is connected to nutrition. And furthermore, when we go into perio and diabetes, we know both influence themselves. So if you don't treat your perio patients for three months and they have a severe periodontitis and they would have to come in for cleanings to make sure that periodontitis doesn't go through the roof, you actually worsen their diabetes by not treating them. And we can go through periodontal infection. We can go through all the areas. We can go to cardiovascular diseases. And this gets even more important as we start learning that COVID-19, so that this disease gets more severe when the patient suffers from other diseases, especially cardiovascular diseases and diabetes. So there is a certain link to dentistry that is publicly discussed right now in Germany. We don't have real data on that as the crisis is too new, but at least from common sense and from the literature that exists, we can say that a good oral status, a good oral health is definitely quite good for the general health of the patient, especially in this pandemic. So asking who needs dentists when you have happiness, right? Is there any difference between teeth and no teeth? And we can see from the literature that the people that have proper teeth have a lower rate of hospitalization when they're older. So some of these studies have quite some biases. And here come two very important studies. This one was pointed out by a good friend of mine from Singapore. This was extremely interesting as we enter neurology now. The idea whether patients who have less teeth are more inclined to fall. And this study proves that having 19 or fewer teeth leads to a higher risk for incident falls. So there is something with balancing and teeth. It's not researched what that exactly is, but there's something. And this is one of my favorite studies ever in medicine, it's the NUN study. Uh, it was more a side finding that they found that the patients with the fewest teeth actually had the highest prevalence and in incidence of dementia. I would have uh, seen that, foreseen that, but the more studies emerge on that topic, the more evidence we have here. And the question on carous control, endo and uh, emergencies, that I will answer right in the end what happens if we're locked down. So we know dentistry is important, we all knew that, but there's enough evidence in the literature that for the general health of the patient, the dentist plays an important role. And we're happy to publish that in a book this year, uh, the medical side of dentistry, basically, it's coming this year. So ask quintessence for an English version, version as they're still thinking whether to get it out in English as well. I will have like this slide you can see right now, little interruptions after each chapter. So if there's any questions to me that already developed through the things we were talking about, we can always answer them in like terms if you wish, right? We know that dentistry plays much greater role for the general health than, than we ever thought, especially when we talk neurology. I wouldn't have thought that. And when I was back in dental school, if somebody would have told my professors, well, dementia and teeth could be related, they would have laughed, right? I would have been kicked out of an exam if I said that. But the evidence is really mounting on that. So the crucial question for all the areas where we close down dental offices until this virus vanishes is, when will that happen? So let's research that virus. And um, from what we tried to extract from the literature, and there wasn't much, we published our first pamphlet on the 25th of March, which was shortly after translated to English. And here we did nothing but summarize the evidence. Things we all would maybe have expected from our officials, but that didn't come. So we did it ourselves. This doesn't make, uh, make us pros on this topic. It just make, made us people who were willing to read into it. So allow me to talk some basics here. We know SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. COVID-19 is the disease and Corona is basically the nickname. In our times right now, these are used uh, simultaneously for the same thing sometimes. So just to clarify what we're talking about. It's very important, especially for virus, that a transmission doesn't mean infection. 
Transmission, especially for viruses that are spread through droplets, is extremely common. As soon as you talk to somebody, you transmit viruses by the little spit droplets that travel all the time. But this doesn't result in you becoming sick. This is usually just hits an area of your body where it's not susceptible for, for that virus and nothing really happens. Very important. Furthermore, especially as we talk corona, we have to distinguish between a droplet transmission, and we know that is what corona is, and the airborne transmission. That is what we fear it might be and really hope it's not. And I can tell you already that we have mounting evidence that we're talking about a droplet transmission and not an airborne transmission. Airborne transmission would mean somebody sneezes and you enter that room after 15 minutes and you get that virus because it's still floating in the air. Airborne means the air conditioning can transmit it. Airborne means our dental spray becomes dangerous. And we have more and more information that it's a droplet infection, so the other, right? Second, very important part next to transmission about a virus is the term inoculation. Inoculation means that a certain virus load has to hit an area that is susceptible for that virus to cause an infection. Here you see a study in mice that demonstrates clearly that mice who are being uh, infected with influenza viruses that are very, very similar in some behavior to coronaviruses are both dose dependent how severely they get sick and second, if they get sick, sick at all, it's also dose dependent. So one virus is probably not enough. We all know viruses don't live, so we can't say we'll kill that virus. We can say we deactivate that virus. A very important thing is that viruses mutate. That's an especially critical part about influenza, but we learned already that also SARS-CoV-2 is mutating. So this study is from the 19th of March, 2020, so two months ago. And it's from Finland, and they already found the first mutations in that virus. So we have to expect more um, mutations in the long run. Transmission is not infection. We need inoculation. But that's the good news also, because if we protect those areas of our body where that virus can actually enter, we're pretty safe, especially as we need a certain dose to enter. And viruses mutate. So even if there is a vaccination that will happen somewhere down the road, nobody knows when it will really come out, but it will come. Even a vaccination will not pro uh, give us total protection. And furthermore, we won't see everybody vaccinated. What do we know about that virus itself? We know it causes a severe acute respiratory syndrome, that's SARS. But the more we learn about the autopsies of the disease of this disease, we learn that it affects the whole body. Basically, every organ system is impaired. We know it enters through the mucous membranes, especially of nose and larynx, maybe even eyes, and it affects lungs, heart, the kidneys, the gastrointestinal intact, basically everything. So this gear is not enough for even facing a patient because the eyes are not protected. We don't know that the eyes can pose an entry port. Probably they don't, but as we don't know, we have to cover our eyes. You have all have seen this picture, it's, it's from Wikipedia. I think it's an amazing illustration of the virus. And it's important to know that these viruses were discovered actually in the United States, not in China. In the United States in the 1930s in chickens, on so animals first, and then also in the United States was discovered that they also appear in humans in the 1960s. They are actually the cause for at least a third of the influenza-like diseases. And um, it's a virus that is, has several subtypes, as you can see here. And the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a beta coronavirus. So we're not facing a new virus, the super virus that has superhuman powers. We are facing a known and well-researched virus family and one has developed into something especially dangerous, but it's still part of that family. Now there is literature on how patients actually spread that virus. There's not too much, but this is an important study from China, 
from the fever clinics and from the ICUs where COVID-19 patients that are severely affected are treated. And it's interesting um, that you can see just around the patients where they are, both in the air and on the floor, virus RNA samples. So it's actually spread. That's something we knew, but here's the proof. Now, the important part of this study is this study tested nucleic acids. So they don't know whether it's infectious particles or just virus RNA. Second, the study could prove that our PPE works wonderful as none of the nurses and doctors working in these fever clinics got infected after they installed proper PPE. What kind of PPE we need? I'll talk about that a little later. This is a second very important study that showed how this droplet infection actually works. So this is the lineup in a restaurant where several people, all those with a red border, got infected. A1, the yellow one, is the first one who got it. So in this study, they research how people got into contact, but important to the right, you see air conditioning and the flow of the air indicated with arrows. And they say in that study that the flow of the air caused the people that were sitting down the road from the flow of the air to be infected. So they concluded that it's a droplet transmission. So that can actually travel one to two, maybe three meters and that the direction of the airflow was the cause for the infection. So yes, by coughing at somebody, by sneezing at somebody, by even talking to somebody, transmission happens. And if that virus lands on the mucous areas, it can even cause an infection. The WHO, uh, there's lots of rumors uh, about that, how good it is, how bad it is. Whatever, they have a large data pool and from 75,000 cases, they concluded that airborne transmission was not reported in a single one. And they come to the conclusion, it's the same with the German health authorities, that an airborne transmission cannot totally be ruled out, but it's highly unlikely. We'll come to that later. So what have we learned? It enters through the mucosa of mouth, nose, and maybe eyes. It's a droplet transmission, very important part. We don't have any proof of an airborne transmission yet. This doesn't mean it cannot be. It means we still have to protect ourselves, but it means it's, as far as we know up to now, a droplet transmission. It's an RNR virus family researched for a long time, and even a disappearance, will, uh, even a vaccination will not give us 100% protection. So here's the question, when it will vanish? Well, probably it won't, because coronavirus, the coronaviridae, this family has been around forever. They have been with us in every spring and fall for every series of influenzas, and there's absolutely no reason why this one should disappear. So sadly, we have to prepare to live with that. Timmy, is there any questions we should answer right now? Let me take a look and just see. A um, lot of this is getting into things that you, you're going to hit down the road. Uh, here's somebody saying, uh, so airborne transmission is just a fear, not proven. Correct? Exactly. Absolutely correct. Okay. Um, uh, I'll remind people that uh, Dr. Trosch is from Germany, so he's not going to be able to answer questions that are specific to our uh, states and the CDC, etc. So those questions probably will go unanswered. Uh, here's a question. Has there been any cases of dentists contracting the virus with the RPPE that we've been using currently? No. Furthermore... I tried to investigate that as good as I could. It's hard to get proper data. But from what we know, I couldn't find a single case of a dentist or anybody in the dental team and staff who got infected during this pandemic with COVID-19 who was wearing their PPE properly and got infected while working. I know several dentists who got infected but most of them were infected in Northern Italy while skiing and being at upper ski parties uh, afterwards. So exactly where the virus totally hit, hit it. And as I know them in person, I can tell you 
this is an extremely severe disease. We must not underestimate it. However, from the life experiment that we were facing now for eight weeks now, with nearly 60,000 to 70,000 dentists working in Germany, we don't have a single case that I could get grips of that was infected while wearing our regular PPE. Okay, and the, the key there being our regular PPE, not updated uh, N95 max, face shields, any of that. Terrific. Not face shields, exactly. Not Darth Vader masks. Um, three layers surgical masks. Okay, I'll hit you with one more question. We'll keep rolling. Uh, just somebody asking about diet and lifestyle changes. Could they prevent future pandemics? I guess they're concerned about wet markets. I don't know. I probably am the wrong person to ask that as you would need somebody researching the biochemistry of immuno uh, defense against viruses. But we know from the patients who got infected that the absolute minority is people who are healthy, sporty, and normal weight. We get more and more data that being obese, that being diabetic, having a chronic heart disease are major factors that cause issues. So probably a healthy lifestyle is definitely a protection. However, I also know two cases that had severe outcomes, one died, uh, who were totally healthy to begin with, but it's a minority, a total minority. Thank you, Dr. Trolsch. All right. So can we work with that virus? Um, to be very honest, as I just mentioned, we don't take that virus lightly. On the contrary, I fear that virus. I try to do everything I can to protect my family, to protect myself uh, and not be infected. Because even although we know that in most cases, uh, the majority of those who have severe outcomes are above 65, have multiple comorbidities. There's also some who suffered badly, who were not in that risk group. And as a second issue, we don't know about the long-term consequences of an infection with that virus. We just don't know about it. There is rumors, it's nothing more than that, of neurologic issues with it. Uh, but we have to prepare, be prepared that we are still learning what this virus really does. So we have to protect ourselves as good as possible, but as, as also be practical. Uh, for everybody who has worn an N95 or even an N100, in, in Europe it's FFP2 and FFP3, for a prolonged time, and I'm not saying a, uh, an hour or a day, I'm saying multiple days following uh, for several hours a day, uh, I can tell you this bruises and it's not comfortable to wear. And this makes our professional life extremely hard. So I personally would prefer to be able to work with our regular masks. And this is why we really researched into that as good as we could. <clears throat> so let's talk about dental spray aerosols. There's one thing in dentistry we all say, always say when we work, for instance, prep a crown, we, we have an aerosol. But that's not totally true. What we cause with our handpiece is the dental water spray. It's a water dilution of, let's say, 99% water and maybe 1% saliva that's basically blown into the air. And it's blown in a, in a really huge amount. And we know from the literature, this is 2004, that measles, tuberculosis, and SARS-CoV-1, like the forerunner of the one we see now, can be found in that spray. There is data that our suction technique, our regular suction, I'm not talking those fancy, huge industrial settings, uh, negative pressure chambers, extra oral suctioning devices that cover the whole room. I'm talking our regular high volume suction from the dental chair, that they already reduced the spray by 90%. And these two amazing individuals, Tommy and Howie, I've been tossing thoughts with them for really a long while and we came up with some ideas. And finally, after weeks, we came up with a setting in our office, how to visualize what we're doing. And this is what I'm gonna show you now. I haven't really shown that a lot. I have shown that once or twice before and I'm happy to share that with you guys. This is a regular red handpiece. <laughs> 
And the spray cloud that I'm pu putting up here is nearly 70, 80 centimeters in a top close to a meter height. So it's a huge spray. And you see how long those droplets take to rain down. They rain down forever, right? So this is a special camera setting so that we can make them visible. Now, same experiment, water comes, but now we add some high volume suction and it just comes in from the side, right? You can see it being lowered here and you see how the droplets are sucked into that, but only word is you still have droplets raining up on top, right? Third setting, suction active and handpiece. And you see how those droplets first, the small one, then even the bigger ones are sucked into it more and more and more. And all of a sudden, the closer we get, the smaller the spray cloud gets. We're down from nearly a meter to something 15, 20 centimeters now. And when I cut the water, rain's gone. Just the droplets are gone immediately. And that's a very important thing to know how that spray cloud develops, right? So this is the special pictures of what we cause when we head up and we speed up our hand pieces. And you can see how that suction works with all those little droplets being drawn in. The closer we get, the more we suck in, that's logical. And you can see even little, basically tornadoes going into that suction. The closer we get, the more we, we reduce it. Now let's go into the oral cavity. Here you see the setting with an active suction and you see how sharp and clear the teeth are, the oral cavity is, and how sharp and clear that spray is that comes out of the handpiece. Second setting, same suction devices inside the oral cavity, but they're not active here. And you, we even had to turn the handpiece away that, uh, so that we can still use the camera because it got all fogged up. And you see how foggy everything in there is, right? Direct comparison active non-active suction so we did that test and we had shields with indicators and we just literally saw them wet up when the suction was not active and we had no hum humidity whatsoever when the suction is active so a good and efficient forehand suction technique is decisive for our protection here and this is my surgery setup this is how i was operating on patients during the pandemic like I was, this is a picture from last week. Um, so you see surgical mask, um, loops, gloves, sterile overcoat. This is me uh, putting an implant, right? So my sponsors for this, you know, are Bego and Geistlich. Thanks again for this. And how bad are we off when we do surgery compared to restorative work? Now, this is the surgical handpiece. And you can see the, the vast difference of the spray cloud here. We have like a height of 20, 25, maybe 30 centimeters, so a lot less, large droplets. And as soon as we cut it, droplets are gone. So the speed of the bird turning is decisive for aerosolizing the spray we emit with our hand pieces. And we know that in our spray, things fly around with that, right? But even more important is that the contact to the patient who might be infected with COVID-19, because as you all know, one of the problems with COVID-19 is that even asymptomatic patients may spread it. Now, with that risk knowing, limiting the time you spend with your patient is crucial. So if we look into digital surgery, like this is a, a 3D individual mesh for augmentation, um, that we use a lot, especially for the non-healthy patients to not have a harvesting defect. This is how they look in reality, how we put them in, right? I, I prefer lecturing about these things. Um, and this is a 3D guided implant guide, right? And all these, all these technical advancements, all these digital options help us reduce the operation time of the patient and thus reduce the exposition time for us. And remember, we are all talking dental procedures, producing spray, AK aerosols. But imagine you just sitting with the patient, not producing any sprays, and the patient coughs at you. That's it. That is the infectious part. Let's step out of your operatory. Let's go into the supermarket. You're there just to buy some nutrition that you desperately need to survive. And the patient in the line behind you doesn't put his mask on fully and coughs at you. 
there you go. So just to make sure that we're talking a little bit within the balance of things, the biggest risk is not the dental spray. The biggest risk is a patient who might be infective and coughing, sneezing, or touching things with um, potentially infected hands. So the dental spray can be reduced efficiently, but it's the time with the patient we have to talk about. Louisa Mortak, she's amazing. She does, does all those pictures with me, and thanks to her for all her work uh, in this. Now, one of the decisive studies, and this is a very dis important study, in talking about aerosols and surface stability of that virus is this one from the New England Journal. And the authors could show that in a lab setting, I, I repeat, in an experimental lab setting, an aerosolized SARS-CoV-2 or one virus, works for both, they test both actually, can be floating in the air and maybe even infectious for a couple of hours and up to days on certain surfaces, for instance, plastic. Now, this is an experimental lab setting, right? Where they experimentally aerosolize active viruses and then test that in that aerosolized chamber. Let's look into the reality. Let's look at air samples that are, were collected in a distance of 10 centimeters from an infected patient who doesn't wear a mask and there's nothing in there. Let's look into another check where they had air and PPE swaps around patients. And one PPE swap of the surface of a shoe front was active. So this again shows us droplets transmitted. But the air samples collected around the patient's breathing, attention not coughing or sneezing, just breathing. This is what we would say airborne transmission. <clears throat> Call airborne transmission, I'm sorry. Uh, this is, is not positive. So we have studies, not, not few, mounting evidence on this that just breathing, also called aerosol or airborne, is not transmitting the disease. Yes, RNA can be detected in there, but probably not active viruses. And now let's talk PPE. That's a three-layered surgical mask. I wear that all day long. I wore that all day long before that crisis, and I'll probably be wearing that until the rest of my life. Uh, because when we do a big tumor surgery, for instance, or big bilateral hip graft for a multimorbid patient who needs an augmentation, we're easily several hours in the operating theater. So I was amused to constantly wear these. And the interesting thing is, and this is a, a very important study, that the international guidelines of the official bodies on this are totally not consistent. So this is not a study, not a review of the papers we have, and I've seen that study floating around in the internet a little bit. This is a collection of recommendations from international organizations and professional bodies. And it's a Cochrane review, actually. And it's a very important one, as it shows that only 50% of all the international sources recommend FFP2 masks, aka KN95s, or equivalents. Um, only 33% advise a surgical hat. Seriously, why wouldn't you want to wear a surgical hat when you know droplets transmitted? I want to protect my body's surface so that I don't touch my hair and smear it somewhere. Only 67% of all recommendations indicate that staff should wear masks at all times. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, this is BS. We should see 100% here. The prime source of cross-infection is people talking to each other. And a little bit later, I'll show you our hygiene rules and we implemented them on the beginning of March. So when that virus was really having an outbreak in Italy, before we had the first confirmed case in Germany and the number one rule we installed, you'll see that in a second, every staff member upon entering the clinic puts on a surgical mask and doesn't take that off for the whole time they're in the clinic. Exception is eating and drinking, and only if you're alone in a room and that room has to be ventilated with fresh air. This is the prime source for infection. So we can see that the official recommendations uh, somehow are um, maybe not totally thought through. So allow me to show you evidence on this. This is a study from 2009, and I love this study, as they foresaw that in a a pandemic, N95 respirators will be in a short supply. Wow, 
So we have known that for 11 years and it happened. This is a little bit scary for me. Even more important for us, this they tested on influenza and you know one third, at least one third of all influenza-like diseases is transmitted by coronaviruses. 23% of uh, the nurses, the medical, the healthcare professionals were infected when they wore a surgical mask and the same amount when wearing N94, N95s, sorry. And here comes the point, they checked influenza viruses. Now let's look into this study. This is from last year. And they came to the same conclusion. N95 and medical masks have the same effect on protecting the one who wears, which is a very important finding as surgical masks were never made to protect us. Surgical masks were made to protect the patient from us. When we open up body surfaces, we sneeze into the patient. Everybody knew for decades this is a source of cross-infection but nobody ever thought of protecting us with this. So this study is so important as they explicitly checked coronaviruses. And they came to the conclusion that um, N95 and surgical masks are on a clinical setting. It's absolutely on the same efficiently, efficiency level. Important here, please. In a lab setting, an N95 or N100 or KN95 is always superior to the three-layer surgical mask, as you can test just right through it. However, these clinical settings test the whole thing, not only the five minutes you breathe through that. They test the whole day, where these masks are far more rigid, far more uncomfortable to wear, even the fitted ones, they swap a little bit around the exposed part of your skin. They swap back and here you have it under your mask. Uh, people probably, probably not wearing it so diligently. People being bruised and then being susceptible to other, other viruses through the bruise they have. Stuff like this. And here comes the holy grail. Nature Medicine, brand new study that tested explicitly how good do surgical masks protect for corona. How, thick, how much corona do they filter? And the effect of that study, the quintessence and the result is 100% is being filtered. However, here comes the bad news. When we're talking influenza viruses, the ones in the blue circles, some get through. So for all of you listening here, who are not vaccinated against influenza, please at the next possible in, um, moment, get your vaccinations against influenza viruses. I kicked that out through time reasons, but what we really fear is that swine or birds flu becoming really transmittable from human to human. Because here, our surgical masks, as I can show you here, are not perfectly safe. And second, for birds flu, for instance, we face a death rate of 60%, regardless of risk factors. So we are facing something like the Spanish flu more or less exactly 100 years ago. I'm not saying SARS-CoV-2 is not dangerous. Again, it is dangerous, but we have to get it into the balance and we have to see where it really is. Now we see a lot of people posing with KN95s, N95s and N100s with a wolf. Now it's very important that through the wolf, the mask totally uses, loses its effect for the patient. With the wolf, you breathe through that and the patient will get infected if you bear the infection. So cross-infection is possible. <laughs> and furthermore, there are rumors, thanks to Dr. Lozada for sending this to me, there's an official paper from the uh, Swiss community of dentistry that the prolonged wearing of N95s may cause lung pathology. And I tried to research that as thoroughly as I can. There's little, really little literature on that. It's interesting how few literature we find on health risks for healthcare providers. So if you're in any clinical or scientific body, focus on that for the future. So here's a study that shows that there is an additional workload on the lungs with N95 masks. And this is a very interesting study that showed that for the lung, a valve does not offer any benefit. So with a valve in our mask, we just increase the danger for a patient but we do nothing good for ourselves.
So what do we know about that virus? Yes, people transmit it. It's really dangerous. It causes a dangerous disease that affects the whole body. Traces of this virus can be found in the air and on surfaces up to days. Whether they're infectious is unclear. In lab settings, yes. In clinical settings, maybe not so much. High volume suction is very important and very efficient. And our regular PPE, which is surgical mask, gloves, goggles, cap, works fine. Very interesting. I was allowed and had the honor to watch several webinars with Professor Bian. He's the head of the dental school of the University of Wuhan. And they have their campuses exactly where that virus pandemic broke out. And um, they have a very low amount of dentists and dental staff who got that virus compared to a relatively high amount of nurses and doctors. And the Chinese interpretation of this data, and probably we can conclude that it's quite right, is that dentists are always and have always been superstars of hygiene and personal protection because we always work with masks, goggles, and gloves. And this in China probably was the reason why so few of their staff, so of these 2,000 working in the clinics, 0.47% were infected, whereas a lot higher number of, medi um, of medical personnel was infected, that even this basic normal setup is very efficient in protecting ourselves. Timmy, at this interruption, any questions we should answer? Probably they are, right? Yeah, let's, uh, let's do, start with, let's clarify droplets versus aerosol. Yes. So in a medical setting, droplets is aerosol. And that's where so much of the confusion comes from. In a dental mindset, our spray is the aerosol, right? However, in a medical setting, droplets are aerosol. And the other thing, what we as dentists think is aerosol, is airborne. So as I showed that on, on like the fifth or sixth slide, droplets is transmitted by air and we know that in a medical sense aerosols transmit that for instance one of the most dangerous phases of treating a patient with COVID-19 is intubating or extubating with that because then they always cough for everybody who has been with that or who has done that themselves you know it's it's quite a stressful situation and these droplets who are being coughed out there are highly infectious and that's bronchial aerosol However, our dental spray is not the aerosol that's been mentioned there. Okay, thank you. Uh, how long does it take in aerosol uh, generating dentistry procedures for droplets to settle out of the air and onto surfaces? So from the test I showed you, it could, could take up to minutes. Okay, how about uh, uh, rooms with aerosol uh, in them? How soon can we use that after we disinfect, after the uh, patient leaves? In immediately. Well, one very important fact, and I'll show you that to you in the next part, is proper ventilation of your rooms. Okay, and terrific. You get into that, so I'll, I will leave those questions out for now. Uh, should we use air conditioning or fans? Um, we have turned our air conditioning off due to the study I showed you, not to give those droplets that come from the patient extra speed and direct directions we can't control. And is that referring to the uh, study where the in the restaurant where the air conditioning yeah. unit was blowing? Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm assuming then somebody asked, would you place a small be fan behind the operator in the dental chair to move the aerosol away from the patients? Not too bad. The idea is good, but it hits somebody on the other side, right? Yeah, that's going to be tough at the University of Washington. Our, all, our D3 clinic is so hot that all the students have fans. So, oh boy, that'll be going away. Uh... Are you going to get to fit testing of N95s at all? Uh, I don't have that in here because we don't do that in Germany. Okay. If you, I know it's, it's uh, the rule in many countries right now, for instance, Italy uh, and also 
um, quite some areas of the United States, as I understand, to wear N95s for dental procedures might be mandatory. And if you're in one of these areas of the world where you have to wear them, please go for fit testing as A, we know a non-fit tested KN95 or N95 is probably even less efficient. I put those studies out of here. There's quite some studies on that. It's probably even less efficient than a three-layer surgical mask as uh, it still has too many leakages. And second, the bruising of your face will make it really unbearable for you to wear it for several weeks. And second, now we have to talk blood-borne viruses that get into the air through our sprays, finding susceptible areas where they can inoculate on our outer face. We know there's HIV uh, traces in dental sprays, and I don't want to get an HIV infection through my dental spray just because I have bruising of my mask in my face. Okay. Did you say surgical masks need to be triple layer? So in Germany, they have to be. And the studies that I read through are all referring to triple layer. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, as dentists, we typically do forehand dentistry. Are you suggesting now with our hygienists and their ultrasonics and their sonics and piezos and everything that we do forehanded dentistry with our hygienists if they're gonna use those scalers? Yes, during the pandemic, I suggest that. Second, there's little gadgets that you can put on the scalers so that the high volume suction can actually be applied on the scaler and is then in a perfect alignment to the scaler and sort of is good for forehand uh, suction. And third, if you can provide that, because I mean, personal is short all over the world. And second, here we have to talk cost already, right? Who's gonna pay that extra per hand? Uh, for these cases where we don't have that, we suggest resorting to hand instruments. Okay, uh, so you're provi are you providing the masks to the patients as they enter or are you asking the patients to wear their own masks into your facilities? We ask them to wear their own masks because masks are in short supply right now. Um, they're extraordinarily expensive. Their price has gone up nearly, nearly times 100. And uh, at the end of the day, in Germany right now, it's the law that everybody has to wear a mask as soon as they're inside an official building. So everybody has a mask. Okay. Uh... I love this question. Is the rubber dam used in Germany? <laughs> and it has the benefit of the rubber dam being seen in overall virus load for the team. So, um, oh my, there's so many incorrect answers I could give to that. And Tim, you know me well enough. Yes. <laughs> so we here and there use rubber dam, <laughs> especially where we should. Um, there is two kinds of studies on the rubber dam. Study type number one shows clearly that a rubber dam reduces the amount of pathogens in dental spray. Um, series number two shows that the use of a rubber dam by itself increases dental spray. So I suggest wherever it's possible using a rubber dam with proper forehand suction and you'll be good. Okay, uh, can you please clarify again the difference between aerosol and air droplet? I think we'll need to hit that one more time. Uh, we'll hit that as often as it's needed because it's so crucial for the decision how we have to behave. So when I talk, and the more I learn about this, the more I watch my patients when they talk. And usually when, right, these days, patient wears a mask when we talk, and I wear a mask and everything's good. But sometimes we're in dentistry. Sometimes they have to take that mask off and then they also talk. And I see those little spit droplets traveling, right? And even when I watch myself right now talking to you guys, I sometimes here and there, it's a dark room I'm facing. I see one of these little droplets really traveling away from me. So these droplets are what is contagious because these are big enough to carry a bigger virus load. At least that's how it was explained to me. I'm not an expert in virology here. But this is how I read and what I was explained. The bigger droplets carry enough viruses 
so that the inoculation dose, when that little droplet hits your tongue, your nose, maybe your eyes, the dose that virus is carried can cause an infection. We think, and from the literature it is supported, that drops that we can see that are really, really, really tiny, that are so light that they can float in the air for minutes, maybe even hours, that can also contain traces of the virus in RNA. As far as we know, as far as the WHO goes, as far as our own health officials go, and as far as the literature goes, those airborne particles do not transmit the infection. All righty. Uh, why don't we continue on? You were going to get into the uh, ventilation stuff, I think. And, uh, yep. and then uh, we'll come back with more questions. Thank you very much for taking the time to do this midway. Oh, my pleasure. It's, it's really my pleasure to be with you guys. Thanks for all these questions. It's, it's great questions and they're very important to clarify these things because that's what decides our daily work, right? Before I go into ventilation, before I go into PPE, before I go into the protocols, just allow me to show some things what happen if we don't work for longer times because I actually have one case that really went south because the patient didn't see the patient because she feared a corona infection. Now, we all know we're facing aggressive pathogens. Dentistry has never been a safe profession. Dentistry has always been a profession where we deal on an everyday basis with the most aggressive bugs there are. And they find their way through hard surfaces like dentin, enamel, or even they fight themselves through living tissue like soft tissues down to the bone. And you know that you're all professionals on fighting these extremely aggressive bugs. And there's tons of names for them. And it seems like every peri conference renames all of them just to add to the confusion. Uh, so I won't go into the names. I'll just highlight some things. The ones with the green circle, they make the bacteria able to stick and adhere to flats and smooth surfaces. The ones with blue are able to inhibit our immune response, our immune system's response. And those in red, they can destroy. We have to understand that infections that come from dental pathogens are in more than 95% of the cases mixed infections. So not like on the outer surface of our skin where you usually have one lead bug and that causes all the trouble. In the oral cavity, the bacteria learned to cooperate, to work as a team and to fight us. And they combine all those abilities that can be really dangerous. And you guys are specialists on fighting bacteria that can rip a hole into the mo hardest tissue any living, uh, any living creature can, can create, which is enamel. So what do you think this bacteria can actually do to your heart or to your lungs? And this is where all those issues come from. It can be small like here, right? we all know that. It can be medium where it really causes trouble or it can be large and potentially lethal, like this outcome of an emphysema after period treatment on the upper uh, left. So I've treated that patient for more than a month. I operated several times and I had to go, go into cardiovascular reanimation, cardiopulmonary reanimation several times during the operations because her body was so flooded with toxins. <laughs> This is an interesting case of an osteomyelitis in the lower left. You can see that on the x-ray, right? And it's the only of these cases that I have where the patient refused treatment and only came back three months later. This is what an osteomyelitis does in three months. Compare left to right, please. Lost teeth in the meantime, and the patient came back because he had a huge open defect in the jaws and also had an extra oral fistula. So this is what happens if you don't continue with dental treatment for a couple of months. And this is an especially sad case. This patient came to the dentist in December and he told her uh, that they have to go for regular checkups because there's part of her mucosa on the lower right 
that is um, not good, but he still wants to wait until he takes the biopsy. And he wanted to see her back in three months. And that was March and there's cor Corona. And the patient didn't go to the dentist because she feared an infection of Corona. And in May, now uh, at beginning of, yeah, beginning of last week, she saw her dentist again. And he just right away referred her to us. And that's an oral carcinoma. That's a squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, I just got the histology results today. It also infiltrates the bone already. So that's a huge drawback and the consequences for this patient are severe. So how can we work during a pandemic? As we saw, it's both on the long and the short run important for our patients. Now this is the title of our first pamphlet and we don't think it will ever go away, so let's cope with that. That's how my staff, uh, thanks for them for allowing me to use that photo, run around in the office all the time. Surgical masks, gloves, cap. They never wear something else. The moment they come into the office, they dress up like this and they stay like this until they leave. We change our clothes every day if we have any, um, any uh, like, uh, splatter on it, we change instantly, of course. This is our hygiene rules. And Dr. Hess and the Academy are so kind that they allow me to share all those links to all the documents uh, that we prepared with you guys. So our hygiene rules are in there so you don't have to read through all this. And as already announced, number one, surgical masks have to be worn at all times in the clinic by all staff members. The one thing that I didn't add in these hygiene rules, but I added them here for you, we do a telephone triage. And I suggest you all do that as soon as you open. Uh, call your patient the day before they have the appointment. Ask them for the symptoms that are listed under point 10. And if they don't show any symptoms, document that. The moment the patient comes into your office, they have to disinfect their hands, wear their masks, and again, the same questions are being asked and again documented. So you have within 24 hours a double check on their health symptoms. We don't take the temperature of the patient as we know that's not a reliable factor. And on the other side, there's areas, especially of the United States, let's look at Texas, uh, who doesn't come in with a little bit warmer skin right after walking through the outside area, right? So it's just not reliable. Asking these questions helps a lot. And also for legal causes, please document that because it shows that you did a triage and that you checked within 24 hours twice for those symptoms. And then it's extremely unlikely that you face a patient that is infective and asymptomatic. It can happen, but it's extremely unrealistic. So there's all those rules and you have them as a download. And we had our staff on the 10th of March. So before we had the first cases, go through these, educated them in this and had them sign it. Talking staff, beginning with 10th of March, we had a morning meeting every day. We informed our staff every day on what's happening, what is very likely going to happen. We had our staff wear masks in supermarkets and outside mid-March and asked them to do that to reduce the risk that one of our staff get infected. And you know what? In these two months where we had, usually we would have several uh, sick people leave with flu, with cold, stuff like this. And we compared that to last year. The rate of uh, the flu and of sickness and of cough and everything in the drop office dropped dramatically. We are at zero right now. For two months, nobody had a cold, just by these precautions. So again, this shows how important these basic rules are. <laughs> Personal protective equipment. This is not necessary. I would love to join the dark side <laughs> at this, right? But it just is not necessary. And this is not to mock about the people doing this. This shows how helpless some people are when it comes to PPE, what to do, right? What they improvise. The problem with this picture, these are all pictures from the internet. I don't know who made them. I hope nobody's offended by me using them. The problem with this picture is the, the guy wears wonderful PPE, right? But if you look at the area surrounding it, 
there's so many areas where smear infection could, could result from. Now, this is a good friend of mine from Switzerland, Dr. Stefan Ulbrich, and he shows the perfect setup for us treating in these times. He uses a rubber dam with the patient. The patient has a mask until it's needed that the oral cavity is exposed. Everything is empty except for the things he needs and can be disinfected right after you doing it. He wears great PPE on a regular basis. We prefer not wearing shields as there is conflicting evidence whether it maybe even make the virus stick longer under that shield. So if you have good goggles that cover your eyes properly, prefer the goggles, but shield is probably not, not a problem as well. That's how I walk around in the clinic every day. I don't even say hi to a patient in a different setup. You see mask, gloves, and hat. If I do any procedure that creates bladder, I add a disposable gown that I can throw away. And if I have to treat a COVID-19 positive patient, I wear an N95 as we have to. I wear a face shield as my goggles don't fit with this mask and I wear a disposable gown. Very important, this valve that you can see here is blocked from the inside. So it's sealed off. We just have these, but it's sealed off so that I don't pose any additional risk to the patient. That's our standard setup for treating patients even, even during the pandemic, as long as we don't create excessive splatter. And at this point, allow me to thank our staff in our office, but allow me to express my gratitude to all the dental team members out there. Hopefully some are watching too. It's not just nicer to work with you guys. You just don't make us happy. Sometimes you make us cry, but you also prove to be very protective. Your work protects all of us from cross infection. You're very important for everyday life. So how do we disinfect rooms? <laughs> There's a lot talk about the need of fogging, right? And uh, I mean, we're dentists, we're gadget addicted. We need a gadget for everything. And we, we just love the idea to buy something, put it in a room and everything's cool afterwards. Let's look into the evidence. I tried to find evidence swipes versus fogging. And you know what? I find nothing. I find a UV uh, disinfecting, but it's the most of this evidence is for water. Now, what we find is that if we do fogging, every study from hospitals highlights that a prior swiping of all surfaces is important to make sure fogging is efficient. We have data that fogging alone can be used from aircraft industry, from airlines. And I fully understand that idea. Can you, can you imagine you are there with your swipes and have to swipe down a whole aircraft from the inside with all those, I mean, surfaces in the chairs? That just doesn't work, right? Here, I understand that fogging is the main thing. And they can also more aggressively fog in there. But this study, very nice study in a hospital ses setting, looks into aerolyzed, aerosolized hydrogen peroxide. It looks into uh, vapor. It looks into UV. And it com comes to the conclusion, manual cleaning is essential. And then you can fog on top if you wish. But we also know that, and this is one of the very few studies that examines spray-based disinfection and wipes. It comes from the Ebola research on the PPE of these people, and it shows that wipe and spray is equally effective. Now you have to know in Germany, we're not supposed to spray the room and then swipe it. We have to use cloth that is drenched in disinfectant solution and then swipe the surface with it. As uh, our health of authorities tell us, that the inhalation of too much disinfection is actually bad for your lungs. So we know that our regular disinfectants that you all have been using in your office for the last decades are highly effective against SARS-CoV-2. That is for the first, but also for the second SARS-CoV virus. So they all work for an intraoral cleaning Prior to every procedure, we ask to, for the patient to rinse with 1% hydrogen peroxide for one minute. 
we know that's highly effective to kill the virus that is in the oral cavity. We know chlorhexidine digloconate is a lot less effective, so we use hydrogen peroxide 1% for one minute. And there's lots of literature that it's, it's going back to the 30s, right? That ventilation of patients with a lung disease or an influenza-like disease improves the outcome. This comes, it goes back to the Spanish flu. It's interesting that there's few studies that actually examine that. How does it affect people if you just open the windows? However, there's many studies that show that insufficient ventilation increases disease, increases disease transmission. So we have to vent as much as possible. We have to wear proper PPE. We have to work in a room that's clean where no redundant things are standing around and that can be wiped down easily and we're fine. And I know there's people who um, use, some of my friends do that, improvised fogging devices. Please be careful with that, especially in the United States under a legal perspective. We know that the inhalation of disinfectants can cause lung pathologies, for instance, asthma and COPD. And there's quite some studies about that, uh, although there's less studies than I expected this to be. So what kind of additional measures can we do? We can, of course, normal, normal cleaning, very important is triage. Call the patient the day before they come in. Second, ask the patient when they come in uh, if they're still healthy. Document both. Make sure your waiting area is not crowded. If we are run over by patients, which can happen, if we have several emergencies coming in at the same time, we make them wait outside, we take their cell phone number, and then we call them in by cell phone so that we don't have a crowded room, so that we can actually enforce social distancing by roughly two meters, which should be six feet in the United States, something. Have the patient, when they're in the operatory, when they enter the office, have them disinfect their hands, have that make them not touch what they don't need to touch, uh, we have set up our reception desk as a no-touch area, and we have signs to tell the patients to do that. Guide them into the operatory, have them rinse with 1% uh, hydrogen peroxide for one minute, and then go ahead. Yes, it tastes awful. Yes, it's mandatory if the patient wants to be treated by me. Um, we charge a surcharge at the moment, which would be roughly $10 per procedure, for extra PPE and all that, that we have to invest uh, for every patient. Uh, we try to reduce the time spent with the patient as much as possible. We don't, don't shake hands and we make sure that uh, people don't bring their friends and family to the office. The only exception are disabled people who need somebody supporting them. Everybody else stays out of the office who, doesn't, who is not a patient or who is not working there. Very important is the correct handling of surgical masks. Um, we know from numerous publications, especially from Ebola, for instance, that the best PPE is only as good as you use it. So you can use a spacesuit, you make a mistake by undressing, you're done. So at the end of the day, handling our basic equipment is so important. And we know that so many of us don't. Here, me. Uh, like three months ago, you could see me running around in the office with my surgical mask hanging here below my, my chin and uh, grabbing instruments with my glove and stuff. Basically, I was a pig in my office. So all those rules we learned back in university that we shouldn't do. Sorry, the bad news is they, those rules are important and we shouldn't do that. And to train our staff and to train ourselves we put together a guide how to use a surgical mask, how to put it on, how to put it off, how to handle that, it, this if you want to drink. Because if you just throw them away after each use, you'll run out because the supply is so short. So you have to handle them correctly. So this guide is for your download. Uh, and we also have the same guide for patients as it's now mandatory to wear certain masks for patients in civil life. We have a guide for that. And uh, it shows how to apply it correctly, how to use it, how to use substitutes as, like scarves. It, scarves is there for your download. Thanks to Pablo, 
who even translated that into Spanish. It's also within the download links. And Dr. Smulders, he's a great guy. He even made the effort to translate everything in Dutch. So we have parts of what we did. We have everything in English. We have parts of what we did in Spanish, parts of it in Dutch. And we, I know it circulates in French and uh, some areas, uh, some other languages too. So what can we know about dentistry with SARS-CoV-2? Surgical masks are enough for the health of patient as far as we know, and as far as the field experiment of Germany and Sweden has proved in the last eight weeks, it works. In Germany, N95s are required for patients with COVID-19 symptoms. You have to wear them, and we do that, uh, although we don't know if it really adds to our protection. Masks, goggles, gloves, and a cap are standard for every patient on an everyday basis. Uh, we never even approach the patient on a different, uh, we never ever approach with a different setup. Um, high volume suction is extremely important. Our standard disinfection and sterilization works. No, you don't have to change your sterilization equipment. No, you don't have to buy new stuff. Everything you did in the last 10 years is absolutely fine and sufficient. Just do it as the protocol requires. And we all did not do it, including me. Fogging is nice as an add-on. If you wish to do that, please be sure not to run into any health or legal risks when doing that. Uh, fresh air is important. The triage is crucial and we have to take hygiene seriously. Allow me to summarize. From a medical perspective, there's absolutely no point in interruption dental, interrupt dental work. It's neither beneficial for a patient's general health, nor it's good for the trust basis we work with the patient. You all are superstars of personal protection of hygiene. You always have been, you were forced to become that. And the rules you are sticking to, if all the physicians in the world were sticking to these rules, they had less issues. So we as dentists are very well prepared. Our standard equipment is like already enhanced equipment in, in hospital settings. We have to be aware of that. Our basic biohygiene has to be strictly enforced. And as far as we know, airborne infection is not a big issue. We're specialists for oral health and we're important for the general health of our patients. You guys are important that you work and this crisis just teaches us what we have always, should have adhered to, uh, good hygiene is important. And there's a Churchill quote, I love it, I quote it every time, never waste a good crisis. So that's probably the situation to, to emphasize and strengthen the standard protocols that we should have been using every day. There's so many people who took up that fight with me uh, against that misjudgment of dentistry in this crisis. And allow me just to show pictures of some I can't show everybody I would like to show, but these people fought so hard for me with the really the beginning on that I want to thank them and many more for standing with me. And uh, I love to talk about augmentation implants and I'm extremely happy that I'm allowed to be in that big Geistlich conference coming up on the 20th of May together with my professional idols, Professor Urban and Professor Okutso, uh, to talk about augmenting complex defects. And I'd be happy if I can see some of you there. Allow me to thank you for your kind attention. Here's the email where you can reach out to us if you wish, but also of course on our Facebook site. And you don't have to look for that. Timmy Hess will send the links to all the papers around. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for spending so much time with me. Oh, thank you very much. We've got some, well, we've got uh, 86, 87 questions. People, please take a look in the Q&A section. Up, uh, vote the questions you want answered. There's a lot of these questions are redundant. I'll try and hit a few here before it's uh, Dr. Trosha's uh, bedtime there in Germany. Okay. <laughs> I'll have, uh, I'll have a gin tonic with you guys if you allow. Uh, okay. Yes, you can have a gin and tonic. That's fine. Um, so uh, just tell me, um, we love gadgets. Do we not need to buy these external suction devices? Uh, do any of that? Now, imagine. Here's your spray, right? And it sprays. And here's you. If not even talking Corona. 
with all that other pathogens in the oral cavity. I don't want that smear in my face forever. When I come home, before I touch anything, before I cuddle my baby, she is eight months old now, but also before I cuddle my wife or who else, right? I go to the shower because I can stand the feeling of coming from my, off from my office and not having showered. So if here's the source of our dental spray, right? And here's me. I don't want an external suction here because I'm in the way. I want the suction here. So what you always did for hand protocols is what you want. You want it here because if you do that sufficiently and you can do that, wear a face shield, have your assistant apply the suction and you uh, use uh, your hand piece and train with them as, as long uh, as until your face shields don't get wet. And then everything's good. An external suction, if it adds for your well-being and if you think, Maybe for marketing reason to demonstrate to your patients you're doing something, that's okay. But it does not really help with our situation. Okay. Uh, for those of you that got on the webinar late, yes, this is being recorded. It will go on to YouTube at Washington Academy of General Dentistry is our channel. For those of you that are interested in uh, the handouts uh, that uh, Dr. Trosh talked about today, those are on the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Facebook page. You're going to look for the business page to uh, get those downloads. Uh, talk a little bit about masks. Level one, two, three. Are level three masks three layered or uh, what, how do you distinguish those? Um. I have to admit, I'm not uh, totally familiar with all the classifications that are around the world. There's gazillions of classifications, right? But the, the surgical mask that we were talking about is the three-layered paper mask that has been everywhere in dentistry and in surgery. And this is what we're talking about. There, I know there's paper masks which are one-layered, and I don't have proof for what I'm saying now. I was just told by a Chinese friend who told me that most of the Chinese dentists, please correct me if I'm wrong here, usually use one layered masks. Oh. And what I've heard is that also many dentists who faced the pandemic first were just using one layered masks and even they were fine. So we don't know about that. But I suggest, and there were discussions in the United States that some KN95s proved to be total rubbish. So I suggest that a good American surgical mask that we can rely on is probably better than unreliable KN1000. Yeah, absolutely. And we're, we're having the issue that a lot of us that got on board with this early on bought some of the KN95s and now we're finding that those are uh, not approved by the FDA. Alrighty, uh, do hygienists need a shield when they're doing a uh, treatment? Uh, what are the increased risks of sh a shield? And I think you uh, touched on that uh, briefly. I can only touch it as the literature is not clear and not good on this topic. Now, if you imagine, you have a shield around your face, right? And imagine this is a little bit of virus that is here. And you're basically really breathing under your shield all the time. So the theory is that maybe, could be, nobody knows, that might even increase the risk of a small virus load to actually inoculate you. So we don't know. Shield is definitely better than no eye protection, right? So if you have good fitting goggles, Scuba goggles would be amazing, but seriously, who wants to do that? Uh, but if you have good fitting goggles who go to the end and who cover your eyes nicely, I prefer those to a shield. Additionally, to, I, I really, all the time, I feel like I'm, I'm caught in a plastic box with a shield in front of my face all the time. So I prefer the goggles, but if you have nothing else, use the shield. Um, goggles don't work well with loops, that's true but I have goggles with loops installed, so I don't have that. Okay. Lots of people concerned about getting too hot in the office if they turn off their air conditioners. Uh, what, 
what do you think about uh, having uh, little portable air filters in each operatory? What do you feel about uh, putting a fan in the window to draw the air out of the room? Drawing the air out of the room is definitely not a bad idea, absolutely, because you also cause some wind and the air circulates better, good idea. Um, I suggest before you die of, of your body temperature, put the AC on because your risk that the IC harms you is lower than you dying of a stroke because you overheated, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the questions are clicking through very quickly here. Uh, there was a question about uh, seeing you in an FFP2 respirator uh, yet you say that's not necessary. I don't remember that, but uh, uh, somebody, uh, I think Dr. Schuler pointed that out. How often do you wear a respirator and what, for what procedures? Um, so in Germany, we have to wear a respirator, basically an N95, if we treat a patient who is confirmed of COVID-19 or whom we suspect through his symptoms to be affected by COVID-19. Uh, so in these cases, we wear respirators. However, this uh, rule is slightly not logical. As we know, also asymptomatic patients can spread the virus. We know not enough about the phases of virus spreading. So some claim that the days, just the day zero, day one, just briefly before the outbreak of the symptoms are the most um, are the most infective days. Some claim that it's the days after the outbreak of the symptoms. Baseline, we don't know. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I follow the rules here, but from my perspective, respirators don't offer so much more protection as we could demonstrate. And here's a very important question from Magdalena, air purifiers in operatories that don't have any windows uh, we discussed that in a different panel extensively, and there was a specialist from New South Wales, Australia on that, and he said that in rooms there where there are no windows, uh, HEPA filters would be a good idea. Okay. Uh, comments on use of PPE. Uh, some say use all day, such as shoe coverings, hair coverings. Some say per patient, change everything. What are your thoughts? I can't afford per patient change, both financially and um, from the resources we have. We change um, half a daily. So after four hours, we replace the mask and we replace the cap. We use reusable caps, so we just wash them. Uh, we know, I showed that uh, briefly, we know that at 60 degrees Celsius, uh, the virus disintegrates, so you can just wash it in your washing machine and you'll be fine. And the masks, and here comes the ugly part, we save them. Everybody has a big bag and we place the used masks that are not splattered, just used, we place them in there. As we don't know how long that surgical mask shortage will last, uh, we save them up for the case where we totally run out. And then we know that in just a regular oven by 60 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes, you totally clean them. And we also know that on surfaces, even in a lab setting, the maximum that could be demonstrated that this virus survives is about three to four days. So we save those up one week, two week or something, store them. And in case we totally run out of our supplies, we're going to basically revamp them and reuse them. Okay, terrific, thank you. Because there was a question about reusing those, uh, we'll call them level three masks. Uh, is there any uh, evidence to denaturing the virus in dentistry through our hand pieces or ultrasonics? I think they're asking, can we add anything to our water lines that would actually be protective for us and our patients? We don't know. Um, what helps, and this has been proven, is hydrogen peroxide 1% one, one minute rinsing before you start. We don't know how long it takes until that virus comes back into the oral cavity. We don't know if adding any disinfectant to the water that comes through your handpiece helps. 
uh, we know that you breathe that disinfectant then into your lungs, right? And it's definitely aerosolized. And it's definitely small enough to enter your lungs through your surgical mask, even to, through your uh, respirators. So we don't do that. Okay. Uh, are, is every individual in your office wearing a surgical mask, your front desk, etc.? Yeah. Allow me to uh, quickly and Brandon, mechanical denaturation from the burr of vibration or ultrasonic. Yes, we know that viruses are can be denaturated by that. Uh, it probably just adds to the question we just answered, but we don't know in what loads, what amounts. We still need more research on that. Everybody in the office wears a mask all the time. Uh, even we have one... Uh, employee, she just cares for our sterilization unit. She has no patient contact whatsoever. She wears a mask all the time she's in the office. It's absolutely mandatory. And our front desk, we don't use like these glass walls as there's data that droplets bounce back from that and then spray around everywhere. Everybody, the reception wears surgical masks and we're good. And we have a distance we have basically a line drawn on the floor, which is two and a half meters away from the girls at the reception, so nobody enters closer than like the distance, social distancing distance we would need anyway. Okay, let's see. Lots of things that you've already covered. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, doing these frames that take the N3 that, uh, or level three masks and kind of adapt them more closely to your face. Is that necessary? We, we've got concerns about uh, the virus can get around the mask. That's basically the magic bullet of viruses, right? It comes here, the droplet comes here, then turns 180 degrees and goes back like this. <laughs> I'm not saying this is not possible. I'm saying it's unlikely. If you fit your mask closely here. And we have that in the mask fitting guide. It's there in the downloads that uh, you guys thankfully just send around. <laughs> so if it's fit and snug here and fit and snug here, the openings that you have on the sides are what it makes able for you to breathe comfortably all the, side, all the time, right? And if they are close to your cheek here, if they fit nicely, you'll be good. Okay. Uh, CDC donning and doffing recommendations require hand hygiene four times per patient. Do you think this is excessive? Yes. Um, the next thing that is in short supply is disinfecting solution. And we have something that I never hoped I would see. Beverage companies who produce hard liquor and beer turn to disinfecting solutions. They abuse our drinkable alcohol <laughs> so that we can hand sanitize. You know what? <laughs> I'm, I, I'm paying for a liter of disinfectant. I pay about the same amount of money right now than I pay, pay for a good bottle of Glenmorangie. So something's completely wrong right now. Um, at the end of the day, um, I disinfect my hands every time I enter an operatory and I disinfect my hands every time I leave the operatory. We know that the disinfectants ba basically also make a smear layer on your hands, especially the medical disinfectants, and this absolutely keeps you safe. Okay. Somebody we're asking... Not oh. We're not facing a super-powered uh, megavirus. We're facing a coronavirus. Would it be fair to say that uh, uh, the touch aspect of this is probably... Uh, more of a concern than the aerosol aspect of it? Um, definitely, yes. We have a stratification of risk right now, which is droplet. Yes, we know, risky. Then we have smear infection, which is the touch part. Could be. And then we have airborne. Probably not. In Germany, have you seen cases of transmission from patient to patient in the dental office setting? None we know of, but the dental offices I know at least, they were really strict in enforcing social distancing, distancing from day one of the pandemic. So 
probably that's the reason why they just had it not happen. And the question that came just in from Magdalena again, Magdalena, you're giving us great questions. Thank you for that. Just water and soap is not better and it's not equal of hand disinfectant. You have simply to use both. Washing hands alone has been demonstrated to be extremely infect efficient in reducing the spread of influenza. But it doesn't make a dis, it doesn't make um, your hands basically virusless or or doesn't disinfect your hands. It just cleans them, and that already helps in ninety five percent of the cases. But to go the extra five percent, you just disinfect on top, and you're fine. But please don't overwash your hands. I have seen that. I've been asked that too. People who wash their hands at least four times an hour. Please do not, as you wreck your hands, and then pathogens really can get in. All right. How do you clean your loops then? With soup, uh, soup, sorry, <laughs> soap and water. Okay. So no special disinfectants or anything? Nope. You if, have they're any... if they're splattered, I disinfect them with hand sanitizer and then wash them. Okay. I made the mistake of using my steam cleaner to clean mine and took off the protective coating because of the, uh, the heat of that. So we won't do that again. Uh, okay. Oh, how do you handle PPE changes to do hygiene exams? Um, official answer. If you do hygiene, you usually have spray and splatter, and then you should definitely change. Honestly, we, we uh, try to avoid as much as spray or splatter as possible. And if our PPE especially our mask and our cap are still okay, we go on. Okay. Uh, you covered this. You, you can use washable surgical caps. Uh, you've already talked about uh, no special uh, high volume evacuation systems necessary. Uh, let's see. Uh, that's too long. Uh, uh, okay, sorry, a lot of these were redundant. And please, uh, Dr. Nowak, uh, don't jump a line there by putting your uh, question in the chat feature. Uh, are slow speed hand pieces safer? Uh, should they use be more use it more than high vol or the or high speeds? That's an interesting question because. We saw, as demonstrated in our trials, that um, we actually have less splatter if we go lower speeds. So from what we found, um, if there's a situation where lower speed help is, is still getting you to the same result, why not? Okay, a high number of patients are asymptomatic and can be infectious. Should we treat every patient as if she, he or she has the infection or is infectious? Yes. This means, I totally agree. Uh, we treat everybody as if they were infectious. This is why we wear surgical mask, three-layered surgical mask, and goggles, and all the time. Because that's the primary way of infecting people. Okay, let's see. Do you change your shoes when you get to the office? And along those lines, are you using any kind of booties? No, nope. I nope. have shoes. I always did that as I'm a surgeon, right? We have quite a percentage of people who have bloodborne diseases. And I never use the same shoes outside of the clinic than inside. And my shoes get disinfected once a day at the end of the day. And that's good. Okay. Uh... Uh, again, uh, you and your staff are wearing the same surgical mask the whole day and not changing for each patient. I think you already covered that you wear them for half a day and then save those and are able to reuse those. Are you just using like a convection oven, putting them in the uh, paper bag in there uh, for a period of what, 50 minutes at? Uh, I, seriously, I seriously hope that I never have to reduce, reuse the masks in that bag but if that, <laughs> i really hope so but if that time comes 
I will take them, place them side by side in my reg regular kitchen oven, heat it up to 60 degrees, 65 degrees Celsius, have them in there for 30 to 40 minutes, then take them out and then I'm going to heat my kitchen oven up to 300 and 400 degrees Celsius because we have to be aware that there are bugs out there that are much more resistant than this wimpy virus. And uh, if we place things in our oven where we actually eat out of sometimes, we should make sure that it's cleaned afterwards. And there is pathogens that survive 100 degrees. And we all know that. That's why we have our sterilization equipment. Uh, what are your recommendations about pregnant staff members during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? There is no, um, there's no evidence of any, is it vertical in English? Vertical transmission uh, yeah. between mother and child? Is that correct? Okay, thanks. Um, there's no evidence of that. However, um, in Germany, our, you know, we're basically in a very socialist state here. Our working rules are very strict anyway. So pregnant staff members are in no patient contact whatsoever. And uh, pregnant staff members, in my perception, can be at the reception desk uh, with a surgical mask, but shouldn't be closer to that anyway. Uh, any suggestions on our tubing for not nitrous oxide? Does it need to be sterilized? Sorry, I didn't get that. What about nitrous? Nitrous oxide, our tubing that we use, uh, nitrous oxide, um, do we need to sterilize that? That's an effect and you're good. <laughs> yes. For, okay, I'll try. For all, for all you... those requirements, I'm sorry to say, for, say that to everybody who tries to sell you new, cool, expensive equipment, do everything as you did the day before you learned that something like COVID-19 exists or how you should have done it then. And then you're good. Uh, okay, I'm. I do. You, can you open your Q and A feature there? Uh, maybe just look at this question by Dr. Schuler. Why not crushing the pandemic as recommended by Yanir Bar Yam, rather than keeping dental offices open and run the risk of e.g. super spreader events? It would take five weeks, then you get rid of the virus, and you don't have to live with it forever. Um. Not. I'm, I'm trying to find that one. I can't find it. Sorry, but I'll answer that. It's Number okay. one, we won't ever get rid of that virus. If you want to close down dental offices, go ahead, close them for good. Okay. Uh, Easy answer. Okay. Uh, let's see. And something else, please. And this is something that comes from the bottom of, of my heart and that I take extremely seriously, and I don't want to offend, offend anybody here, but I still have to say that. I think it is utterly wrong and extremely disrespectful to speak of dentists as potential super spreaders. There is nothing in the literature that shows that a well-led and well-cleaned dental office poses any kind of infection risk for staff or patients. I've researched the literature as thoroughly as I could, and the only events that are reported for any kind of cross-infection trans, uh, cross in the dental office is uh, dentists who did not take hygiene rules seriously, who were using used uh, instruments several times on several patients in a row, or, uh, for instance, when it comes to herpes, who were um, touching the herpes lesions while also working on the patient with the same gloves. This is the only kind of reports we have from literature that shows that dentists were transmitting any diseases. So I uh, ask you all to be extremely careful with the combination of dentist and super spreader as it's A, not true, and B, risky. Okay, lots of questions on electric hand pieces and whether there's less uh, aerosol with those. Not necessarily, right? Because we're, we're controlling with the electric. Exactly. Okay. 
Uh, 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 what kind of, no, I think we're pretty well getting to the end of these questions. Oh, there's one uh, person um, uh, thought you didn't quite understand when we asked the question about doing hygiene exams. So when you're working and doing your dentistry and your hygienist needs you to come over, what are you going to ah. do? We don't have that term. I'm sorry, I misunderstood that. So okay. um, when I am like normally dressed up for normal examination outfit, I'll show you the picture to make sure we all understand each other properly. Uh, so when I am wearing this and I was, do you see that right? Yes, we and, do. Thank you. I was just in a room and my hygienist calls me over to have a look. I don't change nothing. I change my gloves if I was wearing them, of course. I will disinfect my hands when I leave my operatory. I will disinfect my hands again when I enter the next operatory, but I won't take my goggles down. I won't take my mask down. Okay. Do you have any experience with 3D printed masks and, and the different filters, any of that stuff? I don't have any experience about that. Um, I'd be a little bit careful as you are self improvising and self experimenting. And in any case of legal setting, uh, I'm pretty sure this the same in the US as in Europe, you would have to prove that the equipment you were using was certified. And if you're um, improvising on that, I, don't, I doubt that you're in a good position. I'm, I'm pretty sure many of these work wonderfully. Um, I'd just be careful here. Yeah. Uh, People are still asking, are, would you put an air purifier in each operatory? Um, no, we don't. We don't even have one. Um, there's nothing in the literature that tells us that for coronaviruses uh, and SARS-CoV-2, we even need something like an air purifier. If you have windows to open we suggest you leave your windows open to have proper ventilation i really love the idea that came up here to have a fan to direct the uh, flow of the air outside of the room i really like that idea um when it comes to air purifier if you have rooms where you don't have rooms you can open uh, windows you can open then it might be a smart idea to add on but nobody can tell you if it's necessary if you feel better with that why not uh, and have friends who do that. As long as you have windows to open, I don't see any reason to do that. And if you don't have windows to open, it might be an idea. Okay. Yeah, but we're going to be so uncertain what quality of air purifiers we're buying and et cetera. I, I, yeah, I know we love gadgets, but I'm not sure what's going to work. Uh, are scrubs okay for the whole day? Depends on what you do. So. I wear my basic stuff. Well, that's a fresh one, right? I would never wear a used uh, shirt from the office at home, but that's what I wear the whole day. I don't change that. When I have any splatter producing situations or when the patient coughs at me, then I change. If I can foresee splatter coming, I'm wearing a disposable gown over it. Okay. Surgical caps, what material should it be made out of? Whatever you like, paper, cloth, gold, if you can afford it. It's a little heavy maybe in the long run. We know copper has a very good virus, <laughs> virus disabling effect, but mine are either cloth and I wash them or disposable ones of paper. Yeah, copper certainly is effective. Uh, question about whether you're double masking um, and in terms of the mask you wear all day. Nope. Okay. And I would guess the key to that is you're really using good hygiene on terms of taking your mask on and off. You're not touching it, uh, which is... That is crucial. It is really crucial to understand that the outside of your mask has to be considered contagious. So handling of your equipment, of our basic equipment, the equipment that was standard on January 1st, 2020, if you handle that correctly 
and we didn't do it, handle it correctly then. But if you handle it correctly now, it protects you sufficiently. Okay. Uh, questions still on the suction you attach to the ultrasonic. Do you know the name of that or anything? Um, I, I answered that in the chat already. I sadly don't know. I'm, I'm really hunting okay. for that. And, and as soon as I have it, I'll share it with you, Timmy, and then you can give it to everybody because I, I want these for my hygienist, hygienists anyway. I know they're on the internet somewhere. And if you just call your distributor of dental equipment, and tell them you need something to add on. I, I was part of a webinar with Dr. Uh, Boom Park. He's uh, from South Korea, and mm -hmm. he showed a setup of his dental chair, which is called Second Hand. I, I don't know, maybe, oh no, I don't have a screenshot of that. Uh, where it's basically an, a holder for the suction unit that's attached to the gem dental chair. Okay. Yeah, uh, you're back. That, Stephen Cohn answered it. Pureback is one of these. There's more of these, and Maureen also. There's more of these, but uh, Pureback is one. Thanks. Oh. Thank you very much. Uh, should we sanitize our faces after surgery, uh, especially for those that aren't wearing face shields? So here comes something I want to share with you. It's a bit personal, and it's really ugly. After I, before I leave the office, I take my surgical mask down, I take my goggles down, I close my eyes, I fill my hands with hand sanitizer, and then I splash my hand and my neck like this. It burns everywhere, but I've done that before Corona, especially when I had to go through an operation uh, where I didn't trust the health status of the patient and had to cause splatter. Um, and I continue to do that. So it's, it doesn't feel nice the moment you do it, but it feels nice just 10 seconds after. But please don't do a mistake I did yesterday, I think. Don't splash it and put your surgical mask right on. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there was questions about uh, donning and doffing masks. I think that's covered. That'll be covered in your hand out there nicely. And that's at the uh, Washington Academy of General Dentistry, the Facebook page, the business page there. So uh, somebody concerned about Oktoberfest. Yes, we are all concerned about that. Uh, are your operatories closed door or open door? Closed door. Okay. Um, in the U.S., we wear long sleeves, so should we change to use sleeve covers as doctors do in hygiene exam? Um, I think what they're getting at is the protective gear most, patient, uh, most doctors are wearing, um, uh, coats that, that are long sleeve, and whether we should use the, the, the sleeve covers that are available. Uh, any thoughts on that? Why don't you wear short sleeves? Uh, because uh, in for our staff members, depending on what state it, it, you're in, the requirement uh, by Wish and OSHA is long sleeve coats that come all the way up and go down to the knees and be fluid resistant. So that's the reason there. Okay. So I, I would I would suggest um, honestly. Um, we, there, there were, the, the data on this is very clear. Um, long, long sleeves are a health risk because you spread things by smear with long sleeves. If you have them, I would suggest you um, sleeve covers would be not, not a bad idea or that you at least here at the risk disinfect them with your hands. Okay. Well, you know what? I think we hit everything pretty darn solid uh, multiple times here. Uh, just maybe describe fogging one more time for those that aren't familiar with fogging. Um, hmm. um, how do I say that? So the idea of fogging is that you take a disinfectant and aerosolize it or put it into a gaseous form and then basically spray the whole room with. And there's gazillions of ways to do that and myriads of, of different 
substances you can use, but at the end of the day, it always is a procedure where you um, vent a room with a gas that should disinfect surfaces. The problem with fogging, and I've, I didn't know that myself until a couple of days before, um, is, <laughs> uh, is that um, we usually, when it comes to pathogens in our area, these don't just lie there naked on the table. They are covered in a membrane of mucus. They're covered in, uh, in, in saliva, in liquids. And if you just fog this, this may be effective. Or you have the same effect you have in the oral cavity when you put in antibiotics on a biofilm. Uh, they just don't get through. So this is why in all the papers I could review, everybody suggested first manual swiping, disinfecting, and then putting a gas on as an add-on if you wish. But for the bug we're facing and for the next pandemic that will come for sure, um, it might be a different game because then we're maybe facing a bug that is resistant to our disinfectants and then we're in big problems. Mm -hmm. But the bug we're facing right now is absolutely susceptible to every we everything we have. So just wiping down with a disinfectant solution is absolutely enough to, to deactivate the virus. Well, uh, you've done about two hours worth here. We really appreciate that. I'm going to give you one last question. So clarify for everybody out there. Okay, you're finished with the procedure. You're, you've wiped the opera, operatory down. How long before the next patient comes in after your spray wipe spray occurs? A good friend of mine, uh, Miguel Stanley from Portugal, he um, founded an initiative, it's called Slow Dentistry. And in, slow, in, his, in his initiative, they uh, suggest having 10 minute break between patients in the operatory. I think that's, that's quite a nice idea, especially as he formulated his ideas about 10 years ago, right? So it's, it's not new. However, it really depends on your situation. What we do is we tell the patient bye-bye, and then we disinfect the room with swipes. We have our windows open uh, and we have um, the preparation for the next patient. And in this easily five, six minutes vanish. If you are sometimes shorter, uh, then I'm sure everything's okay too, right? There is nothing like a set time frame that you have to wait until you place the next patient. As we don't think that virus is truly airborne. And the droplets that the patient emits take few seconds until they flow, fall down on the floor. And there they are infective, but you don't lick your floors usually, right? And I wouldn't suggest that in pre-COVID times too. No. So uh, we had that question too in another webinar, how often do you uh, clean your floors? Well, as often as it's necessary or at every half day as we, it's our standard hygiene protocol and the dental floor in the dental office seriously with all those bacteria that have seen all the antibiotics we have in our you know, casket. Oh, I don't really wanna know what really lives on those floors. Well, uh, Dr. Dr. Marcus Trosch, thank you very much, sir. It's so kind of you to do this webinar for us. For those of you uh, that joined us today, your CE credits will be coming from the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department. This webinar, we're going to transcode it and we're going to upload it to our YouTube site. That should be available in the next three or four hours, depending on how that transcoding goes. Uh, thank you again for the handouts, Dr. Trulsch. We're going to make those available on our Facebook page. That's Washington Academy of General Dentistry. You're looking for the business page there. You're going to have to just look around a little bit. We don't have another great method for getting those handouts outs to you at this time. If we do figure out a better way, we will uh, send those out to everybody that's uh, logged in, registered for this webinar today. You'll be receiving two hours of CE credit. 
just a reminder, up next at one o'clock, Patterson Dental's gonna go over how to reopen your office, looking at the, the equipment. And then at 2.30, Dr. Minou Karbash is going to be addressing uh, your questions from last Friday. So a lot of the questions that uh, Dr. Trolsha answered today, um, she will probably hitting, be hitting some of those questions as well. So thank you for joining us. This is the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE Series. We'd like to thank all our sponsors, the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics, Comet USA, Patterson Dental, the University of Washington School School of Dentistry, and we'd like to thank all our speakers that have helped us with this webinar series. If this is the first webinar you've seen, uh, please check out our YouTube channel. There's over 50 webinars from this COVID-19 pandemic available there. Dr. Trosh, thank you, sir. We will touch base soon and look forward to seeing you in Chicago in February. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Trosh. Thanks for having me, guys. This was a true honor to be with you. Uh, it was amazing. Thanks to all the friends who watched. Uh, I have a good friend who has birthday today. Klaus, happy birthday. Everybody stay well, stay safe. If there's anything we can do for you, please just shout out and uh, reach out to us. Timmy knows usually where to get me, as Herbie does too. Um, Absolutely. Th thanks, everybody, for being with us, for just being with us for two hours. That's amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was just fantastic. And thanks for all the great questions. Uh, that was uh, very helpful. Yeah, thank you for blasting through that. I know that's mm -hmm. tough. I know sometimes the questions can be uh, redundant, but it, it's just good to hit it over and over again. So thank you very much for so many great points and clarification. Uh, uh, I think it's very helpful. Uh, you know, for us gadget guys, it was a little disappointing that there's nothing <laughs> you recommend buying. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, we should take a break and then have lunch. Uh, uh, take care. Thank, Thank you. you again. Bye -bye. Thank you, Dr. Marquez. Thank you. Thank. Talk to oh. you soon. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> have a good day, everybody. You too. See you, Mark.